everybody. We're just getting started here. This is another episode or session of Ask Me Anything. Ask Me Anything is something I try to do at least once a month to really welcome in our new members and address what they've shared is the hardest thing for them right now. So if you're here in the Raising Resilience Facebook group, so happy that you're able to join us. Or if you're watching the replay, just put replay in the comments, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we know that you're here with us. Now, we have a really um, quite, quite a list of questions today, and I want to dive right in. Um, but right before I do, I wanted to bring to your attention that we have a really special recording up in our Facebook group right now. Um, it's all about uh, how to create easier mornings with children. And it's a recap of what we went over in our Easy Mornings webinar series. And so it's a shorter version of that, as well as three extra motivation tips that I want all of you to have on how to help your mornings run more smoothly and how to motivate kids to really get on board with those uh, routines, those morning routines that you wanna create. Um, in there is also a special invitation to join our um, Robust Routines program which does launch today. And we do have a few spots open. So if that's something you're interested in, you'll need to private message me. Just click on my name, hit messenger, make sure you let me know or put a comment in this, this or the, um, record, the other recordings comments. Let me know, okay? Um, and because we have also some really special deals that we're able to extend for just a couple of days. So you're gonna need to reach out to me and let me know though. That way I can make sure to get that um, information to you and get you started before you miss too much of the program. Anyways, uh, we're so excited that you're here. Welcome, welcome. We have uh, Lucia from Scotland tuning in. I'm so glad that you're here. And i um, also going to just drop in the chat and into the chat the link to that recording that's going to be up until Friday. Um, and so you have a chance to watch that if you would like and hear about our new program. It's really exciting. We're kicking it off. We've made beautiful resources. We've got a great group of parents who are all joining, a mix of uh, folks who are in the year long program who are doing it as an additional bonus course and others who are doing it um, as their first course with us. And it's gonna be such a fun time. Parents of toddlers all the way up to teenagers can benefit from robust routines. So that's what's going on. All right, let's dive into the question. So, from Krista H, we've got this question that says, um, my child is four. My biggest struggle is with um, getting on the same page with my child's father. So thank you, Krista. This is so important. We know that getting on the same page is a common struggle. When I um, survey folks in our Parenting Strengths quiz, which if you are interested in, also has on the end of it, a couple of questions that allows you to apply for a parent strategy session. Um, I can drop a link in the chat for you as well. But so we were we were chatting about this and um, when I have folks take the quiz, it's amazing how many people end up putting um, a one or two out of five on getting on the same page with other caregivers. And I don't remember your exact score, Krista, but I know this is something that we chatted about. Um, and it's it makes sense, it makes sense because what ends up happening is that we have the best intention to be on the same page with other caregivers, but then of course, you, when rubber hits the road, you're in the moment, the child is, is maybe having a challenging time and you realize that you actually don't agree about something and you need a moment to um, check in, but then you don't have that moment. And then these experiences can stack up and stack up and stack up so that you get to this place where you're like, wow, we really might disagree about a lot of things. Um, so a couple of things you can do um, first is, and this is how, what I have all my clients do, is start building in the practice of doing, making time for those check-ins, the ones that you maybe can't do in the middle of, of the, the moment, but um, don't let that slide by as, and forget that it happened. Like make note, even say something in the moment, hey, let's check in about this later and do it in a very positive, productive way of like, this is a good thing. <laughs> We're going to check in and it's going to help us feel more aligned, get on the same page, create more consistency for our kids and, um, and our child. And it, it'll be a good thing. Um, for younger children daily, uh, as the kids get older, you can get away with every other day and then finally weekly. 
um, once they're kind of school age, elementary and, and older. It's so helpful. Um, I've had clients even put a reminder on their phone. Did you check in with your partner? <laughs> or did you, did, you did you text your, your accountability partner? If you're a single parent, for example, we create these accountability partners within the program for single parents because you have to have somebody to, to have a thought, as a thought partner um, to kind of create some consistency in the home and to just have that sanity of like, does this make sense that I let this child kind of have their time to cry or should I have maybe gotten in there and done some emotion coaching? How do you think? What do you think? Did I handle the screen time conflict well or not? Um, do you think that kids can handle that many episodes? What do you think, right? Uh, we just had our resilient support teams meet in our year-long immersion, and I could just tell that they were pumped. You know, they each probably had about 15 minutes to just ask, share what was going on, ask questions in the smaller group within the larger group. But all of them walked away with something to try, and they all came back the next week reporting wins from what they had tried just, you know, four or five days later. So this part, this checking in thing is, is a real thing. It's not just something that's nice, that could be helpful. It does help. And if you're finding that those check-ins are not going very productively, of course, I always say, look for the structure and support that could help you get on the same page. And you can do that in a few ways. You can uh, work with somebody who will do the conversation with you and myself and my colleagues, of course, provide that kind of coaching. But um, you can also learn from the same source and that way nobody's kind of stuck in the game of telephone of trying to explain what they heard from a workshop or from a training or from a book or from a podcast to the other person go to the same source look at it together or separately and then come together and as long as it's the same source you're like drinking from the same well and that really helps caregivers to get on the same page last but not least take a good deep look at what your parenting history is like, how did you come to believe what you do believe about how, what children need and what parents, parents' roles are? And there's a whole inventory you can do. It's a process that I love to lead clients through in the beginning of our work together, which is like, let's look at where, you know, where you're coming from. Like, what parenting styles were you exposed to as a child? What opinions have you formed since then? What direct experience have you had with children that kind of informs you about like what they're you know, what limits they might need and what guidance they might need, what they're capable of, what they're not capable of. Um, do that work. It, it, it makes a difference. Like I've had folks walk away from that process saying, now I understand what drives my behavior and I know how I can change my behavior now. Because for example, one client of mine said, I've been ruled by my fear because of the way that I was parented. I don't want to turn into my father and also when people treat me like my like my father used to treat me, I shut down. And so what had happened is it kind of reinforced her like not backing off too much and not being involved enough with her, her child's um, to, to guide him and him kind of walking all over her. And then whenever, especially if he ever used any kind of anger that reminded her of her father, but we, you should have seen her face when she was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've been doing this for so long. And this is a rare client who actually has an adult child that I got to do this uh, process with. And you don't have to wait until your child is 26 to have that kind of insight. So yeah, I really encourage you to examine and take a deeper look at what, what has shaped your opinions about parenting and that can help you to start to get more and more on the same page. Now, good news is that Krista actually signed up with her partner for a, a coaching um, intensive and we've actually done that process and had she's already taken a step or two in that direction um and so they're on their way good news right <laughs> um so congrats to krista and her partner um the next question is interesting this is from leanne um she says how do i get my kids to follow instructions i just love that because you know and it's not she said that she's having a hard time having her kids listen to her and follow instructions is where this um, came from. Now, Leanne, I know that you are on average making really good, um, you know, requests and also trying your, trying to help your three, seven and nine-year-old um, from fighting and preventing them from fighting with each other. Siblings can be tough. And, and so I'm going to assume that you've tried many things and that you are doing your best to uh, kind of lay down the law and give them give them you know clear instructions and things like that. 
However, something you might be missing is um, bringing, getting them to the table to have some collaborative conversations about what the expectations are and how we do as a family. Like this month of October is when I'm working with my year long clients and we do this twice a year on constructive ways to solve problems. We use these four problem solving suggestions from positive discipline and we introduce them to the kids and especially your eight year old will probably be really drawn to this because there's some process, there's some structure, there's like a how to built in. Um, you can start to build in family tools for solving problems that doesn't involve escalating into fighting. When you do that, kids become more empowered to handle problems on their own, which just takes things off your plate in the first place. Now back to the instructions part, there are a couple things. Um, I think that the baseline, like the foundation, and this is why we say, you know, is, is routines. And this is why we say creating smoothly running routines where your kids are really on board and have really bought into them is the fastest path to more ease and enjoyment in family life. For a reason, it's the fastest path for a reason because it's how we spend most of our day or most of the hours of the day, at least Monday through Friday, with our children. And for you, for your in your case, as siblings, right together. Um, and for anybody else who has sibs, you know, like they're spending a lot of their time in these routines. So if you can get on the same page about how routines are going to run, what everybody's role is, how much support is needed, what's a reasonable amount of time. And then you even build in really fun ways to transition and et cetera. Like you can go from a high level of stress to enjoyment in weeks. I mean, that's part of why we built a six week program to get you from, from there, from here to there, um, following a, what we call a robust routines process. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy that we've launched it and we have a chance to support some families with that. And also within our immersion, we spent two months on this. I really think that if you can notice where they're listening the least and the conflicts are having the mo happening the most and have breakthroughs on that routine that you're gonna get the most bang for your buck in terms of effort and time and energy spent. And then from there, you can create like a template of like how you're going to approach all the other routines and or introduce things like the problem solving suggestions um, and get the kids kind of more oriented towards, we have goals that we, we work on together. Yeah. Um, one of my, one of my clients has three kids, three boys at home, similar ages, a little older, but not by much. Um, and as, as Leanne, and they really worked on the routines so much just to get clear about like, what are we doing and who's doing what and how do we treat our, each other during these times of the day? And, and I, I, I kid you not, this is Lee and Sergio. Lee came back and she's like, Vanessa, routines. That was a lifesaver. <laughs> I was like, yes, that's why we started there, you know? And we had some other pieces that we worked on in our year long immersion, such as, you know, coping tools, resilience plans, um, learning each kid's uh, motivation, motivation strategies that work best for them to get that better listening too. But we started with routines. So Leanne, if there's one thing I could do to like, if I could wave a magic wand, I would say, la, there you go. Your routines are running smoothly because that would absolutely change things on a daily basis. So I do point you in that direction. Um, and then from there, you can learn really interesting things like what motivates my kid from within. So it's not having to come from me. I don't have to build all these rewards and punishments. I don't have to push. I don't have to remind. They're actually just motivated to do it themselves. And we've actually built that into the robust routines process. And then we have further training in our year long immersion as well for a reason, because it does help. It really works. So Leanne, I know I tagged you in this a little late. So you're going to want to rewind a little bit to catch the first half of your questions answer. All right, on to Angela B. So Angela, um, she, her question is, how do I find balance between giving my 12 year old his independence, nice, um, and supporting him through challenging times? So always, always we're asking this question, how much support is needed and what is my child ready for to do on their own? And it is a balance. And I think that's a beautiful word that you've, you've picked there, um, Angela. 
you know, I know you have a seventh grader and when he is trying to assert that he's got it, I think the most important thing you can do is connect and don't do one or the other, you know, like just get into what's happening for him and become twice as much a listener as a talker, <laughs> as an orator, <laughs> um, when you're still sussing this out, when he hasn't made a clear um, <clears throat> demonstration of, mom, I really need your help here, or mom, I got this. If he's kind of in that gray zone, you know, that in-between zone, which it sounds like, I think, you know, that's when your question comes up, because otherwise, if it's clear, you would just know what to do, perhaps. Um, lean in and listen. And I would get really curious about his perspective on things. 12 year olds don't really want to necessarily share all the gory details with you unless they start to open up with them. They would much rather tell you what they think about it. So, and then they would love to hear you getting it. Like, I get it. Like, yeah, I get that. That must be tough. I get it. Um, you know, it's it's hard to see a friend go through that and know what to do. Um, I get it. Like, there's never enough time in the day to to get all your get everything done, and it's overwhelming. Whatever it is, like, show show that you get it and hear their perspective on things, and don't dive into the details yet. Like, just be with how they're experiencing it as much as possible. And I say this for twelve and up, six through nine, details like the facts are really helpful. Um, three to six, emotions. What do you need right now? Do you need a hug? Can I help you? Do you are you hungry? Are you tired? Right. Um, and we can build all three of those things in, but I think that with a 12 year old, they will respect and possibly share more if you kind of level up to that level with them. On average, parents are six months to two years lagging behind their child's age in terms of what they need from parents six months to two years. And so when I kind of scaffolded that, right? So the, the baseline of young kids, preschool, preschoolers, toddlers, how are you? How are you feeling? Do you need something? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Um, that, that if you go there first with a 12 year old, they could feel talked down to. Does that make some sense? Like you can include that in how you can support them if they're open to support. But I would start with, share your thoughts, share your, share, share your perspective. I want to see what you're, how you're seeing this. What are you noticing? Um, what stands out to you about this situation? Have you been in a situation like this before? You know, like this is a much more mature approach. And I think that your child, your 12 year old will really like that. Um, Rachel, I'm also curious about where support could already just be built in like a check-in, like a family meeting, you know, um, I have these two clients who, whose kids are a little bit younger, but they're, a pro, they're like precocious, um, I think seven and 10 year olds, um, now, now eight and 11. But at this, the time they introduced family meetings, um, they weren't that into it, but then they got into it and then they got really into it. And I do wonder about what it would be like for your son to self-identify topics that he likes support with by working up to the place where you have a family meeting and there's an agenda and he can add items on there for support. So there's some kind of um, like kind of ritual or tradition or routine around getting support. And that could be a bit of a relief for you because I know that maybe you're seeing a lot of him going through some things, some challenges and some struggles, but aren't really clear like how to open that door for him. Um, so if that's something you're interested in learning more about, let me know and we can we can have a chat. Okay. And I would even encourage you maybe to take the quiz and and see if you can um if the, one of the strategy session times works for you. Um it's complimentary and I'd be happy to talk you through that. All right. Um and that link is in the chat the, to the quiz into the in the comments. It should be, yeah, it's there. Okay. All right, Angela. And I know you couldn't make it live today, but I'm glad you're listening to the recording and you're welcome. It was nice of you to. Can I give a little shout out that you appreciated the recording being there and us answering your question today? All right, so then I also have a question that is coming from Gabby. And then let me see who else. This is like a three part. This is um, Gabby, Paulina, and Melinda. Oh, Paulina. Oh, that's right. We've been talking, Paulina. Hi. Um, so, how can I address each of my ch child's? Wait, hold on one second. Let me make sure I got this right. 
Okay. Um, how can I address each of my child's needs as they request it while juggling different schedules and routines? Oh my gosh, great question. And what I can tell you is that it's it gets harder before it gets easier, but it's so worthwhile doing the work to figure this puzzle this out. Um, this reminds me of my my client Deanna and how she came to me and she had older children than yours, I believe. I think I think um, Gabby, you've got well, you've got a good spread: eight months, eight years, ten years, and seventeen. I know Paulina has three, six, and seven, and Melinda. I know you have two, three and a half and six. So there's a pretty wide, you know, range here. Um, and I know that it can also be really hard to like, you know, turn kids away when they're asking for things. I know that's a pain point here. Um, another thing can be like, just feeling like they're all coming at you at once. Like I used to say to my kids, I'll get back to Deanna's story in a moment. I used to say to my students, like, I only have one brain. It feels like your zombies trying to eat my brain right now. <laughs> like, they're all coming at me, trying to get something from me. Um, and I just like, guys, <laughs> friends, one at a time, you know? Um, so there could be something around, like what, De like what I'm about to share about my client, Deanna, that could be supportive of you. So the first thing is to just acknowledge that you're probably carrying too much. This is also my client, Deanna, who recently um, had to address this. They had both gotten into the position of um, really being like the one who kept things going in the household. And the kids and even partners were very much like um, relying on them in this role to a fault to the point where it was like, well, um, I didn't know I was supposed to take out the trash. You didn't remind me. <laughs> or... Um, like, of course the dishes get, didn't get done. You forgot to tell me after, after, I, um, after I got home or something. So she was kind of starting to like, Deanna, and this is a um, Deanna in particular. Oh, they're both named Deanna, that's funny. Yeah, so two clients named Deanna. Um, they, they both said um, that they were ready to have for the kids to take on more and to come to them less, and especially their older children. And so they, they needed to work that out. And it was around boundary setting. It was around them like redefining their role a little bit, being like, okay, I'm not, I'm not the reminder robot. I'm not the person who is like holding everything. I'm actually, we're actually going to cut, cut instead of it coming from me to you, we're going to start creating things together that help us to stay organized. So they were the ones who like got the whiteboards and started writing, writing down the steps. And we worked through Again, this is coming back to routines, but I think within this is a kind of a, a, like a tender piece, which is what is our job, you know, as parents, like what, what are we actually supposed to be doing <laughs> to guide kids towards independence and get everything done? So I would say that, you know, majority of parents are either overestimating the level of support their kids need or underestimating the level of support their kids need and they need to make some adjustments and some people are doing both so what i would do is i would run a bunch of experiments and clue the kids in on this hey i'm going to see what happens if i don't say anything before bedtime and i just come in and say okay lights out <laughs> especially with the older kids i'm curious what will happen um, if you can't, if you feel like that's way too risky at bedtime, do something simpler like afternoon time where it's not a make or break time of day. I'm curious what will happen if I don't remind you to start your homework, if you can manage getting started on your own. They come to you, mom, can you do this? Mom, 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 or dad, dad, dad. And you just go, oh, I think you got it, hon. Why don't you give it a try first? <laughs> and they're like, what? And they're like, yeah, we're doing that today because um, we're going to see what happens. Something like that could be a great place to start. Um, without knowing more about your situation, it's hard to say like, what would be the first step in terms of like workshopping through your routines or um, sitting down and having your first family meeting or um, maybe your own practices around having boundaries around what you'll say yes to. These are all zones that would be really helpful. So yeah, if this is something you'd like to explore more, feel free to take the quiz and let me know. Um, if you'd also like to book a session, there's a link at the end. We can we can take a look a closer look at that. It's about a 30 minute se session, and we'll just go over your quiz results and chat about these more deeply, and also see if it's a fit to work together. So there is a question about that because it's important that all 
all parties are present for the session that are that are making decisions on um how how daily life is going to go um so yeah please please do if you if you end up booking the session please make sure that folks are are there that need to be there you'll you'll thank me later um okay next question i love these questions y'all are amazing um how can i help my young children manage their big feelings while staying patient myself this is from ellie and tiffany i'll make sure to tag them in the post here on facebook so y'all can see it and find it later um but what i'm curious about is you know when you're thinking about young kids and big emotions like what stories do you have about big kids having big emotions like is it okay for them to have big emotions and most of us are like of course it is they're kids like that they're going to cry they're going to get upset but what i am i've been finding in my now thousands of conversations with parents over the last 20 years is that most of us have a hard time being around tough emotions <laughs> you know they like have a hard time with it um and I did too, and I still do sometimes, although I have these like strategies that I use now to be able to stay calm myself, but it used to blow me out to be around a child tantruming or melting down or, you know, um, really, really sad. Um, how many of you know what I mean? So step one actually is to build up your calm, calm muscles, you know, being able to have the ability to um without having to think about it keep your cool and actually have a strategy guide about that that folks can have access to let me see if i can just grab it here um i might have the link ready i might not it might take me a minute i might have to add it at the end but um it's a way for you to oh yeah i think this is it no that's not it okay sorry i'll, I'll find it later um, it's a way for you to like explore six different ways to keep your calm or find your calm and that that kids also love. And I encourage every single one of you to discover what your personal calm down strategy is and also what each of your family members calm down strategy is like, what, should, what is your go to that you're going to get so familiar with that you won't even have to think about it in the moment and you'll be able to kind of put that lid back on. Um, everybody's different and like appreciates different strategies. So that's why I have a guide and I even have a training in December that we'll be announcing in shortly um, that walks you through those six strategies so that you can really find your personal like resilience plan out of that. Um, so a lot of times people wouldn't even think of that, but what it's what's come to mind, what's 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 been so helpful is that, yeah, like have a plan <laughs> for what you're gonna do when your kid has a big emotion. And help them have a plan so that when they're in that mode and that that brain when their brain is sort of um dysregulated and they're not able to like access all the options they've got something ready to go it's a really powerful thing to have um and it's actually saved a lot of relationships from heading down a really tough path as you can imagine because what happens if you're flipping your lid all over the place right yeah um and your kids are too you end up saying and doing things that you regret later that you even maybe feel guilty about or you just like are worried that they're not learning how to manage their emotions and it's getting worse and everything so oh, you know if we can just um equip ourselves then we can maybe avoid some of those really difficult interactions and you know kind of relationship damaging moments um you know there's a, quite a bit of conversation right now about like how how each um experience that is unaddressed like that's that that where there's an impact either cumulatively or um episodally like does lead to something that would be classified as a form of trauma because it's a, it's an unresolved emotional event that then carries forward and so what we whatever we can do to get ahead of that i, I let's do it let's help our kids understand their emotions have self regulation strategies have more have more self awareness and let's do it as adults too i always say that um and this is from my own experience and what i've witnessed in tremendous leaps in parents as well that i've worked with is that raising children is an accelerated course in personal growth 
and it is absolutely customized to get you to a place of um, more patience, <laughs> hopefully, more resilience, um, more insight into like, you know, things that are similar, things that are different about people, more insight into yourself. Um, it's also an opportunity to like find out what your triggers are, your unresolved emotions of your own and get to the other side of them. Like, I know that I'm a better person because I love children and showed up, wanted to show up well for them. It was like, there's nothing that could have motivated me more than wanting to do no harm to children and show, give them the best role model possible of how to handle my emotions, how to motivate myself, um, how to contribute meaningfully to my household, to my community, et cetera, right? So this is an opportunity too. <laughs> All right, um, how exciting and challenging at the same time. So whether you like it or not, here we go. Accelerated course in personal development. Um, I love this question by Caitlin um, and Melanie um, from our Facebook group. They say, how can I help kids transition from one activity to the next without meltdowns? Oh, this is such a good one. Well, I'll give you step one. Step one is recognize, especially young children, that young, that, that, but all children and people tend to be in their own bubble. Like they really truly are in their own bubble. They don't, at, <laughs> they don't necessarily um, even take in information around them. And I know Caitlin, you have a two and a four-year-old and Melanie, you have a seven-year-old. So there's a little bit of variation, you know, by age, but it's, it's a similar idea that I'm about to share. It's very applicable, which is that if we <clears throat> can recognize that they're in their bubble, and that until we're inside that bubble, it's almost like we're blurry, like we're out of focus. Like any of you have ever listened to the Peanuts cartoons and it's like the, the adults like, wah, 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 wah. I mean, that is sort of what it sounds like unless they're actually paying attention. So if you wanna manage transitions and make them go more smoothly, recognize as, as much as possible that they're more likely gonna be in their bubble. And that in order for them to transition effectively, you need to either find a way to pop the bubble, which is a little bit more startling and can lead to meltdowns or get in the bubble. And so I tend to encourage folks, get in the bubble, right? Get into their little world. Like, what is it that they're focusing on? Get down at their level, focus on it too. Ask one question even. And suddenly, oh, you're here. You know, I was in dinosaur imagination land or I was really into my drawing and I was ignoring everything around me. So I didn't hear you the first three times or I, or I chose to ignore you the first three times you said something. Instead, come into the bubble. Wow, you put a lot of red on this, on this drawing. I see that, simple. Um, can, can, you show, can you show me what you're gonna draw next? I'd love to see. Simple, right? Can take 10 to 30 seconds, up to maybe three minutes. This is not about join their world and go flying off into their fantasy play for 20 minutes, unless you have that time um, as a transition. Like that's probably going to be unmanageable. And a lot of us think it's kind of all or nothing. Like we've got to go all in on doing what they're saying and joining them in the play and being super silly and being in that mood. No, you can do a lighter version, which is just showing some interest, getting down at their level, get in their bubble and notice when they, they really see that you're there. They're like, yeah, oh, hi mom, you know, whatever. <laughs> they actually talk to you then you've got an opportunity for transition. Um, you can also do, I have, this is a high level tip, friends. I'm gonna give you some gold right now. So listen up. Those of you who made it this far in the recording, I know we've got somebody here on Zoom too, I think uh, who's tuning in, Ta, I believe, and Lucia as well. Preview. Oh my gosh. Previewing has saved lives. I, I promise you. I had at least three families in my last cohort learn about previewing, go do it, and then come back and say, why haven't I been doing this forever? <laughs> I was like, well, now you can do it forever more. <laughs> um, but proving what's coming up, like, and just so that they can anticipate the transition. Now, if it's gonna be something that has been a power struggle and a fight, you're gonna be really careful about how you preview it. Um, you can preview it like with, with something that you know is of high interest to them. You can preview it to them saying, being specific about how it's going to go down. So what, what you'll hear is, you'll, you, what, what will happen is you'll see me come into the room, get sit down next to you, look play Legos with you for a minute, and then it'll be time for us to clean them up. What's gonna happen? 
uh, you'll come in the room. Yeah. And then what? You'll sit next to me. Right. And then what's the last thing? Mm, we're going to play for a minute and then clean the Legos up. Okay. Okay. What are we going to do? We're going to clean up. Yes, that's right. Good. Okay. So when I come back in, you'll know what, you'll know what the plan is. Now, please don't try to do this every single moment of every single day. It's exhausting. But for the areas where transitions have been running rough, that's my top golden tip that I want you to all have. Pro tip that I share with all my clients, all for you today. Um, so Caitlin and Melanie, I hope that helps you out. And there's always more to talk about with transitions. As a matter of fact, in our Robust Routines program, one of the options is to work on just transitions for the six weeks, because I'll tell you something. Um, when I uh, go to, to preschools, especially, but all schools, as an educational consultant, they'll hire me for thousands of dollars. Come check out our program and tell us what could improve, because they know that if we can improve something for a day, we can improve it for all the days forward. And that, that has that ripple effect, right? That makes sense, yeah? And so that's why consultants are so valuable and people take the time to bring them in and pay them um, and pay them well because of what, the, what a difference it makes. Now, so much I'm sharing that because I want you to understand that like, you know, this is advice that people pay thousands of dollars for. Um, I sit down and, Ask them to show me their schedule. First thing I do, can I can we take a look at your schedule, your your, your schedule for the day, like your routine? Okay, um, tell me about. Oh, great. Okay, so now tell me about the transitions. I kid you not. Two out of three problems in classroom management or or rough rides in the home have to do with routines and transitions. If we can smooth out routines and transitions my gosh, we've cracked the code on how this family or house classroom is gonna run smoothly. It's incredible. Um, and built in there are things like emotional mastery tools and motivation tools and all these other things, conflict resolution tools. It's all, it all comes along with it. But first and foremost, how are we going to structure our time together and how are those transitions gonna go flow? Um, and it's part of why I wanted, I wanted to mention this also for Brandon and Shelton, or sorry, Brandon and Kayla, um, because they were asking about time management and maintaining a schedule. Well, here you go. <laughs> Breaking things down into the steps of the routine, managing those, like minding those transitions, previewing along the way, all the things that we've talked about today, um, all apply. You know, managing big emotions when they come up. If you've got these pieces in place, so much is possible. Now, I want to turn it over to Lucia and Ta, who are here live. Um, on, on Zoom, if you have a question or if you could, it would mean a lot to us if you could share something that you took away. Same with anybody watching the replay on Facebook and or live on Facebook. Go ahead and drop in the comments or the chat. What's one takeaway? And you might be watching this on our YouTube channel. What's one takeaway from this that you think would, act, would, would make a difference in your family's daily life? Um, whether that's really rocking your routine so they're nice and robust and everyone's on the same page, or maybe it's learning about coping tools and strategies so that your kids and you have your personal coping tool. Maybe it's one of the stories that I told like about both Deanna's and how it's time to sort of redistribute the responsibility in the family. Like what stood out to you that you think could make the biggest difference? And I'm gonna just wrap up with one more tip while you're thinking about that, but please do add something in the chat. Lucia wrote earlier, one day when I was 13 or 14, my mom asked me to stir in the soup pot as she went to the corner shop. I did, but the other pot on the store stove had something else, which was cremated by the time she came home. And I was totally oblivious to the fact because you were in your bubble. You were like focusing on your one pot. Yeah, exactly. And we're, we take for granted as adults how much we're able, especially now that we're parents and we have to, how much we're like actually taking in the whole room or listening for things for, across the house or the apartment or whatever, right? Um, kids though, have this like the gift, of, <laughs> the gift, the innocence of childhood, I guess, the gift, but also like the limitation of being very present of what's right in front of them and bubbling in with it. So it's really interesting. And, you know, of course there's, there's a whole spectrum of how kids show up in terms of how present they are versus how vigilant they are about their surroundings. But on average, kids are very egocentric in their bubbles. And really those bubbles don't tend to pop until at all, really, <laughs> or even like open up really until like six or seven. It's when they're neurologically, it's actually the average age is seven and a half. 
when children can truly empathize and truly like do the cognitive exercise of taking the perspective of another person. Um, with that in mind, no wonder our children under seven are still like very much in their own bubble, but then also understand that's just when it begins. That's when it emerges at seven and a half. And they say that like in terms of developmental um, like milestones, the, the human brain is actually not really done developing until age 24 to 28. Um, and then from there, we have all this plasticity where we can build in skills, we can even backfill gaps that we didn't have. You know, I know I'm hearing about these people, like I'm taking this dance class in this form called bachata that was out of the Dominican Republic from, from someone and she, she just shared, she goes, yeah, if you, if you, if, if any of you feel a little discouraged right now, just know that I didn't start learning how to dance until I was 40. And she's, uh, she's in her mid forties and she's amazing. And it's like, wow, okay, so we can keep learning. Anyways, on a tangent, um, back to Lucia. Lucia says the transitions habit is what she really what she's really interested in. She truly wants to apply it in her own life and work effectively. And this is gold. Oh, I'm so glad you feel that way. And hopefully we'll hear from Kayla and Brandon, um, Caitlin, Melanie, Tiffany, um, Ellie, Gabby, Paulina, Melinda, Angela and Leanne, all the folks we answered their questions that we would just love to hear like even one thing you got out of your part or another part of this, and we can care, help you carry that forward. Um, hope to see some of you all hopping, um, taking the quiz and hopping on my calendar. Um, we do only have a few spots open for that. And like I mentioned in the very beginning, we are launching our robust routines program this week. The doors are closing by, by Friday. We're not letting any, any other new um, students in. Um, and it's a really powerful six week course that if you're interested in, you'll need to message me or show your interest in the comments of this post or of the replay that I shared with you the link to, um, because doors do close on Friday, like no more students. <laughs> um, thank you for your beautiful attention. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share these strategies with you. It's always so much fun to answer your questions. Let me know if you have follow-up questions and we will keep this going. Um, we'll be back next week uh, for another Monday Mindset Moment with a quick tip, uh, usually 10 to 15 minutes. So make sure, you know, put a little reminder on your phone if you want. Monday's at noon, we're here, um, or some other time of the day that you know you can pop in and catch up. All right, lots of love to you all. Hope you're well. If you're here on Facebook, drop in the chat. Let us know that you're tuning in. Put replay or your takeaways, and we'll have a chance to um, connect with you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye, Ta. Bye, Lucia. Lots of love to you all. See you soon. Take care now.